The Northeastern states emerged from the Civil War with their factories intact and scores of immigrants pouring into New York and Boston harbors. Immigrants were coming to America to take advantage of jobs and business opportunities made possible by the country's Industrial Revolution. With the help of immigration, by 1888, one in four Americans lived in the expanding urban areas located between Washington, D.C. and the state of Maine. The Big Apple attracted its fair share of immigrants. The open spaces across the fruited plains attracted thousands of German and Scandinavian, maybe some Irish immigrants, to settle in the Midwest. A large portion of them became farmers. Railroads and technological innovations were critical in helping to grow the agricultural and industrial sectors of the American economy. Because the economy in the late 19th century depended heavily on shipping natural resources from rural areas to factories and then exporting fabricated goods from cities to the interior of the continent as well as foreign ports, the federal government was convinced it needed to set up a national weather system. The Weather Service began in 1870 when President Ulysses S. Grant created the agency under the auspices of the Army Signal Corps and the direction of the Secretary of War. It was assigned the responsibility of making meteorological observations, especially on the seacoast and the Great Lakes, and then taking that information and relaying it to other points on the continent and the territories. Unfortunately, the U.S. Weather Bureau, which was placed under the Department of Agriculture in 1890, was staffed by observers of varying degrees of relevant education and training. The equipment at their disposal was a modest capacity to uh, detect immediate threats. So, forecasts depended heavily on communication between various places. By knowing the direction of wind and weather systems, which generally follow a west to east trajectory across the mid-latitudes in the northern hemisphere, communication between observation points allowed personnel on the leeward or eastern side of the line of communication to know what kind of weather was moving in their direction. This situation can sometimes get muddled, especially along the east coast where backdoor fronts and nor'easters don't follow the migratory patterns of prevailing westerly air masses. In addition to those communication practices, the use of barometers to measure changes in air pressure and anemometers to gauge wind speed gave observers some ability to make predictions. However, the Youthful Bureau also made some terrible mistakes in failing to predict life-threatening storms. Such was the case in New York City in the Northeast on March 11th through the 13th, 1888. The weather for the city was predicted to be colder, fresh to brisk westerly winds and fair weather. As we'll see today on the vantage point, the weather services forecast wasn't close to what actually happened in New York City and most of New England. How did the Weather Bureau get things so wrong? And what impact did the weather have on life in America's most densely populated region? Let's take a trip back to 1888 and the Big Apple to see the impacts and consequences of one of America's deadliest snowstorms. I hope you'll join me. As a reminder, the forecast for the city called for conditions to be colder, fresh to brisk westerly winds, and fair weather. To the Bureau's embarrassing disappointment, the next day delivered the Great Blizzard of 1888. Some observers called the event the Great White Hurricane. As one would expect from such a mild forecast, the blizzard and its hurricane-force winds seemingly came out of nowhere. The daily highs had been in the 50s. Crocuses, tulips, and flowering trees were making the concrete jungle come alive with inspirational colors. Birds that had flown south for the winter were making their way back to the Northeast in New England. If you're like Rachel Carson, the author of Silent Spring, the songs of birds are sure signs of spring and the hopeful promise of good days to come. At that time, 1888, above ground trains as well as horses pulling buggies and wagons were essential modes of transportation in the city. Other residents simply walked to and from work. Because cars and reliable public transportation were decades away, most people in the city lived in apartments. Yet, the city was quite large. 
a number of people made lengthy commutes of upwards of four to five miles a day. So they depended on the above ground trains and buggies. Those who lived close enough to their workplaces simply walked. The spring of 1888 was nearly 40 years removed from the end of the Little Ice Age. The residents of New York State and the city that bears its name were enjoying the unseasonably warm weather and were glad to see lengthy, cold winters become distant memories. Memories created on March 11 to the 13th, 1888 were etched in the minds of those who called the Northeast their home. On the morning of March 10th, a low pressure system that stretched from Canada to Mexico was, as one would expect, moving eastward, but it was being ripped in two. As the squall line reached the Appalachian uplands, its rain-making southern trough split away and seemingly headed out to sea. The remaining cold snow-producing trough in the north began to weaken as it approached eastern Pennsylvania. Fueled by the warm waters of the Gulf Stream, the southern trough turned northward and moved along the coast. As Kate S. Zalzal described in a 2017 piece for Earth, the science behind the headlines, and I quote, the warm moist storm met with cold northern air, spawning the hurricane-like blizzard. As the storm moved up the coast, the high winds dashed 35 ships together in Lewis Harbor in Delaware. By the time the storm was over, more than 200 ships had been wrecked or grounded along the coast, and at least 100 seamen had died. End of quote. This kind of storm event is called the Nor'easter. By the evening of Monday the 12th, declining temperatures and raging winds converted the blowing rain to blinding wind-driven snow. Snow drifts reached the roofs of two and three-story buildings. Doorways and lower level windows on the wood windward side of the apartment buildings were blocked. Upwards of 10,000 train commuters became stranded on the elevated steel tracks. The moisture on the rails froze and caused several derailments. At least one group of residents fashioned extended ladders to rescue people stranded on the lines. Don't get the idea that those rescuers were altruistic. They weren't wearing blue or red capes. They charged stranded New Yorkers 25 cents for the use of their ladders. By the time the storm ended on the 13th, four feet of snow had fallen on Albany and 21 inches blanketed New York City and its boroughs. Nearly 400 New Yorkers died while elsewhere in the Northeast and New England, the storm claimed more lives. Among the dead were dozens of people who became stuck in drifts and collapsed and they froze to death. One of those who collapsed during the storm was former Senator Roscoe Conkling, who lived from 1829 to 1888. At the time, the 58-year-old was practicing law while serving as the head of New York's Republican Party. After leaving his office with the intention of walking to his social club located some three miles away, Conkling struggled through the snow and heavy winds. He made it to the clubhouse, but he collapsed as he stepped through the door. He never quite recovered from the blizzard, and he died on April 18th. As with most things in life, we are inclined to learn from our misadventures and mishaps. Municipal cleanup crews couldn't get out of their stations, so tons of snow were shoveled by residents. As the snow piles melted, though, tons of garbage and horse manure littered the streets. Gas lines, which were above ground like the train system, cracked and broke during the blizzard. In the wake of the white hurricane, New York City made some serious changes. The city buried its gas lines and took the first step toward building the city's world-famous subway system. The unexpected snowstorm was a complete surprise to officials in the Weather Bureau's offices. It taught scientists many things about air masses, fronts, and the interactions of air and ocean currents. Along the East Coast, weather systems come out of the West for the most part. But every once in a while, a nor'easter can form. The Weather Service completely botched the forecast of March 12, 1888, but it taught meteorologists that a warm, moisture-laden, low-pressure center can wrap around a cold front that lies to its west. Weather prediction was clearly not an exact science in 1888. Hey, you made it to the end of the video. 
I appreciate you so much for joining me today. And if you enjoyed this show, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you next time here on The Vantage Point. God bless. Bye-bye.